The Holy Gospel according to Luke, second chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Lord. The child Jesus grew and became strong and was filled with wisdom. The grace of God was upon him. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up as usual to the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they were a day's journey. And then they started to look for him among the relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem and searched for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. But all who heard him were ecstatic at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? You knew, didn't you, that it is necessary for me to be about my father's business? But they did not understand what he had said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. Mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in maturity and grace in the presence of God and man. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you, O Christ. Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, let's forget for a moment that we're talking about the 12 year old Jesus with the lovely halo over his head floating four feet off the ground. And let's just try to not hear these words as we would hearing them in a pious assembly, reading out of a big, bulky, leather bound text. Mother, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know I must be about my father's business? Now, I don't know about you, if I talked back to my mom that way at 12 years old, oh, I would be hearing about it. <laughs> you know, it reminds me deeply of a time when I was about eight or nine years old, when I too was a little mischievous, and it's just a, a compliment to the sanctity of my own parents. May God bless them richly here. The mischief I got into was about the time I lost my vision, about 2001, the Lord of the Rings came out, and one of the characters had a, a deep pension, Legolas Greenleaf, for using a bow and arrow. And all my friends were getting bows and arrows, all of them. So to be inclusive, to be open, to champion uh, her then nine-year-old blind son, uh, my mother said, fine, after I bugged her to death to get me a bow. So we made our way to the sports store, me hopping up and down, uh, looking a little too excited to get my first beginner's kit, but we didn't know it was a beginner's hunter's kit. <laughs> Whether the arrows were still tipped or not, I leave to the further retelling of the story, which might have grown in the years. But we got into the house, and I was told, well, you can shoot these arrows anywhere, because we thought that they were a toy, you know? Well, there was this wonderful big box TV. You know the TVs you used to drag out to the curb, they still would be working? I took that arrow, like a hero of old. I drew the string back. I had one, only one shot. It soared through the air and landed sticking out of the TV. I was in so much trouble. I waited with bated breath for my father to come home, thinking, oh man, I'm going to lose all my Tolkien memorabilia now. <laughs> Action figures will be thrown out the window or something. So I'm trembling in my little boots, and my dad comes to the door, pulls me into a side room. I'm expecting words of admonition. He says, Thank God, John, I've been trying to get rid of that TV for the past six years. <laughs> now head upstairs. I'm sure your mother will read it with reason. <laughs> the sanctity of parenting. You know, the question that was written in our sheet was, is Jesus naughty in church? Now, I don't know about you, given how many times Jesus seemed to upset the religious leaders and conventions of his time, overturning what was the norm for the time, even turning over the tables of the money changers, I'd say Jesus was very naughty in church. So there's hope for you and me. 
but you know when i think of today's three readings they create a kind of triptych now most of us are not familiar with the word triptych i instantly when i began prepping for the sermon yesterday when the pastor called me and uh, put me on notice that i would be in the front line of duty uh told samantha oh yes a triptych a three panel icon so she said yes love i took six full years of art school i know but i will say this the triptych is a beautiful visual metaphor for what we are about to do in this kind of journey through scripture together it is an icon you find mostly in eastern churches where there are three images that are bound together and they become one sacred trinitarian image we have three readings on the feast which is called epiphany or in the east they are, which means to appear. And we are to commemorate, in a sense today, the appearing of Jesus. The church traditionally celebrated the coming of the Magoi, the Magi. So we will begin there. Because I actually saw a visual triptych depicting the Magi about the same time I blew up my poor parents' TV. <laughs> it was a image of three panels together. It showed the shepherds rushing over. It showed the infant Jesus in the manger. It also showed the Magi coming to a toddler Jesus in Joseph's workshop, playing with the tools of the foster father Joseph. And it was in the house of my godmother and Aunt Mary worship. And as I played there on the floor as a kid, not with a bow and arrow, but with a sword, which is plastic, my aunt pointed out to me, that we look at these images, we meditate at these images, because in meditating on the Word of God, the Word comes alive in us. We become ministers of that living Word. Well, the first of these images is that icon of the Magoi, the Magi. Now, Pastor Chris generously offered an interpretation of them as sorcerers. So, Harry Potter? <laughs> You know, the thing about the idea of the Magoi is they were depicted in long, flowing, Jedi knight-like robes. Something out of Star Wars and that little icon, you know, in this oriental dress with these three big chests of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But in reality, although they were <coughs> depicted in tradition as three kings, Scripture never gives a number. And instead, we hear that they are actually members of a Gentile court. Herodotus tells us in histories that they were kingmakers in the ancient world, politicians and priests of the Medo-Persian Empire. Now, okay, that's a lot of Bible mumbo jumbo jumbo. What does that really mean? It means that these were pagans. They would never have been allowed into the temple to worship. They were, in some sense, outsiders. In one sense, they were forbidden to enter into the worship of Yahweh. They came a long distance, though, to follow a star because they believed in their hearts that the sign, that the sign would lead them to the one who would be promised. And at the end, they did find him. And they brought before him gifts that broke convention. Now, I don't know if any of you have seen The Life of Brian, the Monty Python movie, but there is a little skit in the beginning where the Magi show up in the wrong house. And as the Magi show up at the wrong house, and there's a woman and a baby, and she says, Oh, this gold, I like the gold. Oh, frankincense, ah, money. What is this? What, what is this myrrh stuff? Oh, myrrh, it's a, it's a kind of balm or embalming fluid. And they're not wrong about that, because myrrh in the ancient world was a sign that ultimately you would prepare a body for funerary arrangements. And it was a prophecy that was clearly shown, we don't know how. Brother Roy and I could talk all day about prophecy. Is the idea that this child would give his life for us. And that these pagans now get to enter into the covenant of Yahweh. Outsiders, outcasts, now get to worship. And they do so because this child is indeed our propitiatory sacrifice. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So they leave their gifts at the appearing of Jesus, and they are touched, they are changed, and they go another way. 
Now we turn to our second triptych, which has a lot of the same kind of themes. Hannah and Samuel. Now, I know Pastor has these sermons in the morning. Some of them are as early as 6.30. I don't know how all of you do it. I just usually stick with the 11 or the 7.30 for myself. But we might remember that Hannah was a barren woman. She could not conceive in the ancient world. In a patriarchal society, that meant she was looked down on, like the Magi. She was an outsider in some sense. She was an outcast in some sense. The convention was, something must be wrong with you, Hannah. And yet, as we hear about in today's beautiful reading, she gives birth to a healthy baby boy named Samuel, who becomes one of the greatest of the prophets of the Old Testament, who anoints Saul and David. This guy is like a mixture between Clint Eastwood and Obi-Wan Kenobi. He rocks. And yet, here's the kind of interesting thing. Like the Magi, she brings a gift at the appearing of God. She brings a gift which is more valuable than gold, more valuable than frankincense to the divine God, more than even the bitterness of myrrh. She dedicates Samuel to the temple, as we hear of in the book of Leviticus, and we find that she leaves him there. It is Eli the priest who raises this baby Samuel into a, a young man and a prophet. Hannah visits Samuel. But every time she comes with these garments, these priestly garments, she has to go back home because she knows that her boy will go where she cannot go. Her boy will one day go to become an image of what it means to stand as a man of God. And like the Magi, she leaves perhaps her even more precious gift, her only son, and she leaves touched, shamed, moved like those who would come after. And we turn to the third triptych, the story we all think we know, of Joseph and Mary looking for their baby boy, their Jesus, for three days and three nights. And just in case we have been fulfilled in our own artistic love of, once again, a halo Joseph or a halo Mary, this is the Mary with tears running down her face. We hear that she is anxious. This is a Joseph with dirt under his fingernails after working all day long. Flesh and blood people worrying about their child. And like the Magi, like Hannah, Joseph and Mary in some sense are a little unconventional. Joseph would still heard whispers from family. You're still with her. Remember that Mary for a time was an unwed pregnant mother in a society that could have exposed her to stoning, and Joseph stood up for her. And think of the torture that Mary was under, knowing that it was her mission to give birth to the Messiah, and they've lost him? I mean, it's bad enough losing your own kid. Losing God's kid? Really? <laughs> and so we find that they too come before the temple as Hannah came before the tabernacle, as the Magi came before the presence of the same Jesus. And we find that Jesus, in a sense, responds to their anxiety with, one could say, a kind of sassy, childlike form of humor. Did you not know I must be in my father's house? We all know how we love children's sassiness, for sure. But you could say to me, but John, the, the pattern is broken because the Magi left their gifts, the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. Hannah left her only son at the temple. But Mary didn't leave her son behind. Mary brought him home and says that he was obedient to them. We can only imagine what that meant. Try disciplining God's kid. But what ends up happening instead, I would argue, is Mary actually did in a sense, leave Jesus behind that day. Although she did accompany him all the way to the cross, all the way through the empty tomb and beyond. What do I mean by this? That Mary did walk away changed and moved that day, in a sense. Because the response of her son, Mom, didn't you know I must be about my father's business? Didn't you know I, I must be in my father's house? What that really says to her 
is that one day her son, like Samuel, must go where she cannot fully go. That her son will go to the cross for us as our substitutionary lamb. That he, as the true priest, discussing with the religious leaders of the time, will break so many conventions and norms to fulfill the law, not to break it fully, but to transform it, that suddenly what will come to pass will be a death and resurrection unlike any other. And so we, like Mary, we, like the Magi, we, like Hannah, are called to two choices. To either return to the conventional, return to the normative, return to anxiety, distress, and pain, or to take up that cross, to take up the long, unexpected journey of Hannah and the Magi and of Mary, and to follow our Jesus wherever he leads us. This kind of reminds me of another peculiar journey I took. In 2001, I lost my vision to a, an operable brain tumor. We did operate on it, but we couldn't remove all of it later on. It was the reason for my loss of eyesight. And my godmother, Mary Elizabeth Brennan, worship was an amazing example of faith through that time. Whenever my family was going through hardship, she brought the food. Whenever anyone needed a word of encouragement, she was there. And like the Mary of the Bible, when I went through my great ordeals and twists and turns in my ministerial journey, she was a voice of wisdom and, and great encouragement. But in 2020, she was diagnosed with an inoperable cancerous brain tumor and told that she had a very short time to live. And she asked me to do the one thing that brought me here before all of you today. John, she said, I'm running this Bible study. I need you to take it over. I said, well, I'm taking these classes. I'm doing this. Uh, I can't give weekly sermons. Uh, you know, I have too much. And she said, John, you will learn far more and you will love far more teaching the people of God and learning from them than you will learn in all the books in the world. Mary Elizabeth Brennan Worship, my aunt, my godmother, passed in 2021, and she knew vehemently that I would be sent to a ministerial and pastoral role, and the one thing she wanted to leave behind was the acknowledgement that although, like Jesus, she would go where we could not, that her presence would be a reminder in heaven that we all, too, are meant to offer the greatest of gifts, the gifts of our own lives, as Paul reminds us, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. The fact is, although we can't eat and drink at the Lord's table today, although we can't receive Holy Communion, brothers and sisters, we are communion. We are koinonia. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. We are the body of Christ. And if we acted and spoke and, and lived that vocation most fully as we did in baptism, then truly they would know in the world that our God is God and that our Lord is love. All of you have helped me begin the greatest journey the greatest pastoral saga of my entire life. And I know that I stand before you here today because I have been raised not only on eagle's wings, but because you have fulfilled for me the scripture that says, <laughs> Amen, amen, I say to you, whatever you did to the least of these brothers and sisters, you also did unto me. So on behalf of the Holy Spirit, filled with Jesus Christ and the love of the Father, I say to all of you, I love you. I thank you that we are together the living body of Christ.
Let us confate, confess our faith together with the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and come unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. It is my honor tonight, to, this morning, to uh, share the service with John. And Brother John and I have agreed to share in the prayers of the church. Let us celebrate the epiphany, a spiritual act of this, revealing that Jesus is the light of the world. As each week passes during these winter months, we ponder the gifts of the past and the hopes of the future. We look for ways to continue our walk as Christians with guidance from the Word and the blessings of God through the grace of the Son. At the end of each petition, we will say, Child in the manger, and you are invited to respond, Hear our prayer. As the war in Ukraine continues and new acts of terrorism occur around the world, we continue to pray for peace of our Lord to move all nations to radical change and direction to more peaceful goals. Child in the manger. Hear our prayer. Lord of ages, our rock and our redeemer, revealed as a child, teach us the mystery that you have chosen us, not because of any kind of other gift than the reality that you have made us unique, in your image and in your likeness. No matter the obstacles in our life, no matter the crosses, visible or invisible, teach us that we are uniquely loved, uniquely lovable, and sent into the world to be your hands and feet of divine mercy. May our lips be salted with reconciliation. May our ears be open to serve others. May our hands be open to receive the word of life, and let us walk filled with your spirit. Holy Child in the Manger. Hear our prayer. We have domestic tensions, increasing our day-to-day -day stress with rising costs of food, uncertainty in our government leadership and processes, and unstable borders. We pray for humane and logical solutions to our border crisis. We pray for better leadership at all levels of government and guidance for them to make the right decisions for better living conditions for all going forward. Child in the Manger. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we live in an age that is often divided, not only by the idols of politics and not only by the idols that obsess our attentions, but also, too, by the deep and passionate concerns which conflict us. <clears throat> Teach us stillness and peace so that in our activism we may serve love of you in our neighbor first that we may lay down our lives as you have laid down your life for us. Help us to dry every tear and to sit with those who are filled with mourning. Help us to be voices of laughter and of peace with those who are filled with merriment. And let us share in your cosmic Passover feast. For to be filled with you is to be sent out as light into the world. Holy Child in the manger. We ask for the blessing of recognizing our equality in each other 
and working toward harmony in our communities and our world. Let God's love steer us to bring an end to homelessness and addiction, both here and abroad. Child in the name. Amen. Lord of ages, we come before you knowing that there are many in our midst who are filled with infirmity and disease. We know that we ourselves often face great tribulation. We go about our days filled with questions, and like Joseph, and like Mary, even anxieties. You have said 366 times in Scripture, according to Pastor Richard Wormbrandt, fear not, or be not afraid, once for every day in the year, and once for a leap year. Teach us, Lord, not the kind of fearlessness that leads to recklessness, but instead a kind of trust in you, that even when mountains come trembling down, even when we find gates that seem perpetually barred, even when we find oceans that appear unapproachably wide, that you are God, and with you all things are fulfilled, for you are faithful to your word. Teach us that trust and that wisdom. A holy child in the manger. Amen. Last, oh, yeah. Lord, we ask you to provide relief for those experiencing illness or pain, especially our pastor Chris as he recovers from COVID, and in our great family as well as those on our ongoing prayer list, whom we now name aloud or in our hearts. To your hands, O oh Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Now let us show one another a sign of peace. Let us pray. Gracious God, join those people long ago who walked their days to your only son. We now bring righteous praise, adoration, Receive them as a response to the abundant blessings we provide us every day. We pray that you will bring these on our offerings and that you will use them to accomplish your holy will. In Jesus' name we pray. Lord. Make of us a living chalice. Make of us a living tabernacle. Though we cannot receive the bread of angels, we ourselves are called to become your spiritual feast, offered on the table of life's gifts for one another. Lord, we offer this benediction, so that though we walk in the valley of many shadows, we might know your security, and we might know your peace. Teach us divine mercy. Teach us moderation in an age of excess. Teach us kindness, even when it is much easier to lean towards the thorns of bitterness and of wantonness. May this prayer and this benediction that we are about to perform, this holy moment, allow us to enter into the mystery of what it is to become a Eucharistic chalice. For the word Eucharistes simply means offering of thanks. Heavenly Father, for those present here, I offer thanks for them. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we offer thanks for one another. Like Hannah, like Mary, like the Magi, like Joseph, let us not walk away from this holy table untouched. We offer ourselves today in you as the once for all sufficient sacrifice that takes away our sin. Therefore, we pray in unity with all Christians at all times and every place. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you.